Human rights are what we cherish most. All of us want to be able to express ourselves. All of us want to be treated fairly and equally. We wouldn't be human beings without human rights. There are serious issues that we have to confront um, in dealing with vulnerable populations in the United States. In some respects, the abuses of human rights do not deserve comparison with the abuses that take place in many other parts of the world. But we do have violations which are very serious to the, uh, to the people who are victimized uh, by them. We cannot believe how inhuman the new immigration laws are. It's like a witch hunt. It's like we're all in jeopardy now. We've all been here 20, 25, 30 years. Some of us are permanent residents, some of us are citizens. And we really had no idea how the new changes with immigration would affect any of us. Jesus left late March to a two-week trip to the Dominican Republic. On his returning day, he was stopped at immigration and they tell him they had to ask him a few questions. And uh, next thing you know, we hear immigration has him, and we wonder well, why. Uh, he's got a green card, he's legal, what's going on? They question him on uh, whether he had been convicted of any charges brought against him in the past. He was detained back in 1974 and charged with a misdemeanor. Mr. Collado was uh, convicted uh, and he pled guilty at 23 years ago to uh, essentially having sexual relations with his girlfriend when he was 19 and she was 15. They did a plea bargain with my brother who at that time didn't speak English and he, they just told him, you know, you plead guilty to a lesser charge and we just let you go and we forget the whole deal. It obviously was not treated as a serious crime and it was not a serious crime. It was and still is a misdemeanor under New York law, but under the immigration statute it is treated as a particularly heinous crime in the same category with rape and murder. In 1996, Congress passed laws that made enforcement of the Bill of Rights much more difficult. In part, it's because of uh, a desire by Congress and, and the President to, to be tough on crime. At the same time, there has to be a concern as to whether it goes too far and eliminates or reduces the rights of people who are deserving of better treatment. My mother came to this country before to bring us together for a better life. And I really never expect something like this to happen to me, you know. This was more like a father to us. He always took care of us and he was very protective of me and my sister. I can't do nothing without him. And this is why I feel strong now to continue living because my family is, uh, are out there. And uh, right, okay. uh, you can see the only thing I have here is like cut from them, my my wife, and and uh, to keep close to them. Otherwise, I would be dead here. I work seven days a week because I'm working for him and my kids. You know, when I came out of my work, I come running home to pick up the phone to pay his phone call. How do you feel? He said, Nancy, please keep in mind that this is a maximum security prison. I'm in here with criminals. The trip is three hours and a half. And when I get there, I only can speak with him half an hour. Half an hour. We can't touch him. We can't even hug him to give him some moral support. When I go over there and we talk, he cried. And I cried and we don't talk. We always crying. Then he asked me about the kids and how I'm doing. And I asked him what he ate today. He told me that he gave him mashed potatoes, that he's tired of mashed potatoes. Sometimes we fight with each other. <laughs> one of my younger brothers, he calls me one day. He's like, what are you doing? What is it that you're doing to get him out of there? Are you just going to leave him in there? What the new law does is it creates a term that's been around for a while called aggravated felony. 
but it now calls the most minor kind of offense, theft of cable TV services under this new uh, law, constitutes an aggravated felony. So it's kind of an Alice in Wonderland term where if you call every minor offense an aggravated felony, well then you're only deporting aggravated felons. This particular aspect of the statute is completely retroactive. So a crime which, in his case, 23 years ago, was simply not a deportable offense. So that not only did he do nothing to prevent his deportation, but he couldn't have done anything because he wasn't deportable. How are you doing? Okay, I'm uh, yeah, waiting to see what happened in my case, you know, and desperate to get back to my family. I've been here already for more than three and a half months, and nothing happened. Uh, Under the Constitution, every person is entitled to due process of law. And the Supreme Court has said again and again that the guarantee of due process applies not just to citizens, but to persons, to everyone. The essence of due process is the government can't act in arbitrary ways. The government can't uh, act uh, capriciously. Um, the government can't treat people differently without some rational basis. He's stuck, uh, along with many, many other people in his shoes, uh, with no bond, being detained, and basically having his life ruined. This is a great time when I go to see my family. And today is a very special day for me. Uh, today is my birthday. When I go out there and see them, I feel good, but at the same time when they leave, it's terrible. I have my two daughters who I, I almost lost one of them. His daughter had a horrible car accident. She almost didn't make it. My daughter is back. I think she's going to be okay. This made me, makes me happy now. It's so great to see you back, lady. I love you. The immigration judge does not have the discretion to take into account that he's a great guy, 23 years of proven rehabilitation, a family that will suffer extreme hardship if he's supported. No one could disagree with that in his case, except that the judge simply cannot take that into account. He has no discretion. And this is what makes this law, uh, in a nutshell, so grossly unwise, unfair, and unjust. Now, there's nothing wrong with the United States deciding that a dangerous criminal should not be allowed to live in the United States and that they should be deported. That's a proper and legitimate thing. Uh, for the government to say. But it's something entirely different to say to a legal immigrant who's made a single mistake that they shouldn't even have the opportunity to show that deporting them would be unfair. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Papa. Happy birthday to you. I'm going to keep fighting till the end because no matter how much I'm going to suffer now, i got to keep suffering in order to become together with my family again. We never thought that the same land that would offer us hope and liberty and freedom was going to turn against us and try to just liberally, liberally kick us out. What are they going to do with my children who are American, who are born here in the United States? My wife, born here in the United States. And everything we have is here in the United States. When we first come here, we thinking that we're going to be living here the rest of our life. I have to feel that somebody in a position to make a decision in this case has got to see that your position is correct. That's what hap that what's happening to you cannot be uh, lawful. That 26-hour vigil, that was almost, we felt, our last resort. 
His business was suffering. His family was suffering. His mother was suffering. It seemed like nothing good was happening. Because of all our efforts, attorneys, all our voices being heard on TV, in the newspapers, we were going to be heard, and we were going to be heard in a big way no matter what. Someone came today at around 11.30, and said he had received a phone call from Steve Converse telling us that Jesus will be released at 2 o'clock to please give him a call. When we called Steve Converse and we told them we wanted Jesus here at the vigil, he said he'll be more than pleased to come and bring him here himself. Right. And we was just jumping with joy. <laughs> when I was telling Jalissa, she didn't want to believe me. She said, I don't believe you. I'm going, but I don't believe you. What's the first thing you're going to do? Jump on him. <laughs> what are you going to say to him? I miss you. I love you. Uh, I don't even know. I don't think there's going to be enough of him happens. to go around. <laughs> I want to make sure we don't tear him to shreds. <laughs> Very emotional. I can't talk to him. I'm hugging him first, let me just tell you. <laughs> yeah, right. You better believe in me first. Don't even try to get in my way. Let's not kill him now. <laughs> <laughs> That day was one of the most exciting and scary days. Although he was home, the case wasn't over. We knew that we still had to fight his deportation. I felt like he had been in a war. When people come back changed, they come back hurt, they come back confused. I don't know how this destroyed me. Not only my business, but also myself. I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I'm afraid that I'm going to lose everything. Everything is going down the hole. But I just, you know, trying to do the best I can to survive. This is the only way that I support my family. I'm fighting with myself to take this out of my way and keep going. Hi, Bobby. <laughs> We've learned that the system can and will work for you if you raise enough hell. I can be together with my family now, enjoy my family the way I was before. He got lucky. Everything's over. But a lot of other people who are going through this and have no voice, their lives are going to be destroyed. If you're successful, there is a tremendous emotional reward. Winning a case like this or winning an asylum case, there's no... Uh, no way to describe the, the sense of reward that you feel because you have literally saved someone's life. The law can be um, a great uh, tool for protection of individual rights, but only if there are lawyers there to use the law on behalf of those individuals who need protection uh, of their rights. And if they're denied lawyers, then they don't have that protection at all. They're absolutely unprotected. I guess you heard about Tom Robinson. Yes, sir. Grand jury will get around to charging him tomorrow. I uh, was thinking about appointing you to take his case. I think the great challenge to anyone who's a lawyer is to use their legal skills to make the Constitution and the civil rights laws of our country real and meaningful to the people who need it. I'll take the case. We no longer really have a presumption of innocence in this country. When I go to court, if I'm representing someone poor, if I'm representing someone who is black or brown, I know that many of the decision makers are going to presume their guilt until we prove otherwise. You have to sort of uh, put in your mind the things that are necessary uh, to be an effective advocate in our society, but you also have to keep in your heart the things that are essential to, to have the courage, to, to have the uh, the interest to have the will to do the difficult things that so few people are willing to do. Scout, there are some things that your 
not old enough to understand just yet. There's been some high talk around town to the effect that I shouldn't do much about defending this man. It's only the way in which we treat the poor, the condemned, the marginalized, that we have any glimpse at the quality of our justice, at the impact of the law. In this country, our courts are the great levelers. In our courts, all men are created equal. I'm no idealist to believe firmly in the integrity of our courts and of our jury system. That's no ideal to me. That is a living, working reality. It's a real privileged place, a little tiny role in trying to protect the human rights of people who, um, uh, whose dignity and whose uh, uh, humanity deserve all the protection that society can create. There was an article in The New Yorker by a federal judge who was explaining that although he believed in the death penalty, that he took it seriously and that he found it personally troubling. And in the course of that article, the judge said that some people complained that the quality of representation in criminal cases wasn't very good, thus increasing the likelihood that innocent people were sentenced. The judge said, well, we tolerate incompetent lawyers in lots of situations. And he had a sentence which just stuck in my mind. He said, um, he said, but the liberals say death is different. And on that Sunday morning, it occurred to me that though it's been a long time since anybody called me a liberal, I think death is different. What is your opinion on the death penalty? Uh, I believe the death penalty is uh, not a deterrent, but uh, retribution. I for an eye, tooth for two. I actually believe in the death penalty. I think that it, it has its place in society. Maybe some people deserve it, some don't, but I don't know. I think it's pretty cruel. I think the death penalty is necessary. As a matter of fact, I think that's not used enough today. If they stab somebody to death, I think they should be stabbed to death. If they drown someone, I think they ought to be drowned. I don't think it's right to kill anyone for any reason whatsoever. I'm kind of up in the air about it because I hate to see someone lose a life, yet I understand that you took a life. So, my feelings are kind of mixed about it. It's kind of, I, I can't even understand it myself. I think if the average person knew what happens in the average death penalty case, and I'm not talking about the celebrated cases that get on TV, but the poor person accused of a crime who has a court-appointed lawyer paid a token amount of money, often a person of color tried by an all-white jury, uh, often a person with mental limitations or mental illness, and the jury never hears a word about that person's mental illness or mental limitation. I think if most people knew that that's the reality of the death penalty in the United States today, uh, they'd be truly horrified by what's going on in our courts. George McFarland was convicted of murder. He was convicted of the murder of a man named Kenneth Kwan, who owned a convenience store in Houston, who was murdered during a robbery. He was... Uh, tried and convicted in a trial that in total lasted about three days, um, during which his lawyer, a 72-year-old Houston lawyer named John Ben, um, by the accounts of everyone who was present, uh, literally slept through most of the trial. When you, when you give an attorney some money, or when the state appoints you an attorney, you expect for them to do everything generally possible to help you. Because of the inadequacy of our clients' prior lawyers, um, there had been no factual investigation done on the case. So we had to start that from the beginning. The only evidence in the trial that connects George McFarland to the shooting of Kenneth Kwan is the eyewitness identification of Carolyn Barton and the testimony of his nephew, Craig Burks. We're here right now at the same location. It looks about the same. The cars are different than it was probably in 1992 when this offense occurred. One of the major witnesses was parked approximately right where this little yellow car is parked, and that was Carolyn Barty, who was working for the city of Houston Police Department. Carolyn Barty, the eyewitness, said at the scene of the crime to the investigating police officers that she thought the person who was shooting uh, was about 5'7", of 
uh, medium weight and light to medium skin African American. In the courtroom, she picked out George McFarland, who's six foot or more, weighs about 200 pounds, and has very dark skin. The jury was never told of her earlier identification, the simplest form of cross-examination. Young Craig Burks, the nephew, testified both that George shot Mr. Kwan and that George didn't shoot Mr. Kwan, that somebody else did. That was never pointed out to the jury. There's no physical evidence. There's no forensic evidence. There's no fingerprints. There are no ballistics that tie McFarland to the case. Uh, only those two pieces of evidence convicted. This is what we think of as the nightmare case. This is one where we really are saying, for all we know, you have an innocent person here who's sentenced to death. I've done a lot of things that truly I was punished for. This young man, Kenneth Kwan, I didn't kill him. What affected my decision to take on the case was not my view about whether George was guilty or innocent. What affected my decision to take on the case was that the process by which that question is supposed to be determined so clearly failed here. We was all sitting around. It was like dinner time. I was not cooking. And Harrison knocks at the door. Knock at the back door. And that's when they tell it was the police at the door. And they all just rushed in. They took George outside immediately and was talking to him. Then they came back in the house and asked me could they search the house. And I asked them, did they have a search warrant? They said no, but if I told them no, they were going to tear up the house anyway. So I told them to go ahead and search because I didn't have anything to hide. So they really tore it up anyway. This was not George McFarland's first scrape with the law. And generally speaking, people, particularly people in Texas, believe that they're better off to get a private lawyer than a state lawyer from the Legal Aid Society. And so McFarland, uh, on whatever basis, um, decided to go ahead and, and retain Ben. John told me, he went, he said he looked at the files. He said, man, you're not going away. He said, they don't have anything on you. Nothing to prove that you've done anything. I can get you out. He said, trust me, believe me. The judge in the case, knowing of Ben's reputation around the courthouse, was worried that Ben, left alone, would not be able to provide an adequate defense. So the judge took it upon himself to appoint a young lawyer to assist to help out, to do what we call second chair, to sit in the second chair at council table. A fellow named Sandy Melvin. Sandy, uh, in his uh, affidavit, said that he put between uh, seven and eight hours getting ready for a capital murder case. Uh, Mr. Ben said he put in three hours getting ready, so a grand total of ten hours preparation uh, for a case that's going to, you know, potentially cost George uh, McFarland his life. We knew we was going to get railroaded. We wouldn't know it was no hope. Patricia was there just about every day, so. Then I turn around and I look back at her, little George, and Gregory, right? And when I look, he, this was the first time I ever saw him was asleep. Well, the McFarland trial, it seems like it was just sort of a, really sort of an afterthought that day. But when I did walk in, I saw this guy, John Ben, up there just literally just conked out, you know, snoring and everything else. And it was just amazing. I don't, I'd never seen one quite that blatant. A bailiff reports that he was sitting behind Ben and regularly nudged him uh, to wake him up uh, until it seemed to be doing no good and he gave up. It got to the point where sometimes he'd go to sleep when one witness was on the stand, when he'd wake up, somebody else would be out sitting up there. I never knew that he would fail me like he did. I put a lot of faith, a lot of trust in him. When they got a break, I went up to John Ben and I said, you know, were you actually asleep during the course of this trial? And he, and he said, well, it's real boring. You ever go to sleep during a case? No, I close my eyes. Rest. In this McFarland case, I did. 
Yeah, he said he, he heard you snoring. Yeah, well. <laughs> now, a different question is, why didn't the judge say, this is a farce, this is not a trial we're having here, we should start over? And I went up to the judge afterward, and I said, you know, I mean, this shouldn't be going on. I mean, everybody in the world deserves, you know, a better representation than that. He said the uh, Constitution uh, guarantees everyone the right to an attorney, but he said there is nothing in the in the Constitution about the, law, the lawyer having to be awake. You know, the fact that he was asleep is in some sense the, the sound bite of this case. It's the sound bite that has people paying attention to this case. If you didn't know that Ben was asleep, which you wouldn't know from reading the trial transcript, you would still be appalled at the quality of defense that McFarland was given. Were you surprised at how quickly it went? Yes, very surprised. Especially when they came back, they didn't take long for the verdict either. It was just too quick. The jury was out for one minute, I'm sorry, one hour and approximately 20 minutes to find uh, George McFarland guilty. And in that one hour and 20 minutes, they also went to lunch. And he wasn't even was there. John Bent wasn't even what? He wasn't there when they read the verdict. Where was he? He was late coming from lunch. The facts of George's case were so outrageous when you um, think about what happened at his trial that we can't even reach the question of whether he's guilty or innocent. Um, that's never been determined by a court. I'll go first. I'll black him first, uh, please. The George and Gregory don't know that I'm on death row. They know I've been locked up a long time. I think I'm to the point where I want to tell George Jr. and have him guide little Gregory. My wife, Patricia, she's a soldier. She's strong. She helps everybody. She helps them. She helps me. She helps herself. And I think she gets so lost in trying to make sure that we are right to, to hide from what's really ailing her. Yep. Well, that's just a it's nights where I can't even sleep. I'm missing them. Yeah, he takes the hardest because he always crying. He sits here and he plays with these bolts. He pushes on this fence and this glass. And when I ask him to stop, he said, why? It might help you get out. I pray that he come home soon. It's hard to keep telling him that, you know, he coming here, okay? People on death row are the most hated and despised people in our society. They have literally been condemned. They have literally been rejected from the human community. Uh, and what unfortunately has come with that is a disconnection from the rigorous application of the law that many of us in this profession feel like uh, is something that we can never abandon. Do you think that the system that's in place gives people a fair trial? Absolutely. And they get plenty of chances I think a, a fair trial is very tough to come by. A, a fair trial depends on who's your lawyer. If you have money, money always talks. It's like money runs a marathon. Money makes the world go round. We don't live in a fair society. So that's just part of the deal. It sucks, but what are you going to do? Innocent people who have been killed, I think that's what we have to pay for all the others that, you know, should be killed. The uh, justice system is uh, certainly not colorblind, but it is colorblind to one color, and that's green. If you've got money, you can get off. Okay, so what about indigent people or poor people who can't afford to get the they're, uh, they're at the mercy of the justice system. On appeal, Mr. McFarland said that he received ineffective assistance of counsel because Ben slept through the trial. And the judges on the court, I believe, in the decision 7-2, to two, uh, disagreed with Mr. McFarland and affirmed his conviction. The Texas Court of Appeals has a wonderful line in their decision in the McFarland case. They say, while we don't condone sleeping by counsel during trial, we are unable to conclude that it establishes a claim of ineffective assistance of counsel. I and another judge, Judge Morris Overstreet, dissented. And our reason for dissenting was is that the entire adversarial system had broken down. Whether it be retained or appointed counsel, you're entitled to an effective and competent representation under the Sixth Amendment. And Mr. McFarland simply did not receive that uh, in any manner. If you are placed in a jail or prison, 
pursuant to a state court order. The Constitution gives you the right to have a federal judge review the lawfulness of your incarceration. Now, why is that important? It's important because in most states, judges are elected or they are vulnerable politically. Capital punishment is probably the most prominent issue in any of these campaigns. How do you feel about the death penalty? What votes have you cast in certain death penalty cases? There's no doubt that writing dissenting opinions or voting to reverse a capital murder case that has received all this notoriety is probably risky in the political forum. And you can really take out the word probably. It is risky. There's no question about that. But, you know, we take an oath, a solemn oath, to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States and of this state. And it would be doing less than my oath required of me if I was to turn a blind eye to a case where I thought that the conviction was not soundly based in the rule of law. There's just so much pressure on the courts to get these cases through and carry out some executions so the politicians can say we're being tough on crime that the courts are very indifferent to a lot of the really gross injustices that take place in these cases. I think it's very disturbing. I think fairness has become a casualty of the war on crime. Where we are right now is at the Huntsville unit. It's known locally as the Walls unit. This area in which we're standing is the area in which the witnesses to the execution come in on the night of the or the day of the execution. Once the inmate enters the death house, he will come to approximately this area where he is met by two correctional officers and with a chaplain. Once he is strip searched, he is taken and put in this cell. When the time comes, the warden will come back to the inmate and say it's time. He goes from the holding cell, which is approximately seven or eight feet, to go into the execution chamber. Have you ever seen someone be executed? Yeah, one. A guy named Henry Martinez Porter, his execution was pending and he didn't want his family to come to it, so he invited three reporters. Once the inmate enters the execution chamber, he is strapped down very quickly. It takes a matter of seconds. The arms are stretched out in this manner. Now, the IVs are inserted in the crook of the arm. At that point, the warden will ask the inmate if he has any final words. Those words are amplified through the microphone, which go into the viewing areas. This guy had been very nice the whole time. Of course, he's dried out and been sitting in jail for a year. You know, he obviously can't do anything to me. But anyway, he had been very pleasant and very polite and all that. And they put that guy on the table and he just went crazy. It was just total personality transformation. This is your honky justice, you know. He just started screaming. It was kind of amazing. The first solution starts flowing. That is a solution that essentially renders them into a coma. It takes just a matter of seconds for that to happen. There's a window behind the gurney. And you know when this piece of gauze lands in the window that the flow has started. And I mean from the time that, you know, I mean, you know at that point that they're killing. The second solution is a muscle relaxant, which collapses the diaphragm. And accordingly, the lungs collapse. And that's really the only audible thing that you hear about the entire execution is the escape of air from the lungs. The final solution is the one that stops the heart. The entire process takes maybe two and a half or three minutes before the inmate is dead. It was just so fast. You know, I was sitting there trying to write down all this stuff about honky justice. By the time I looked up, he was gone. I just walked out of there not feeling what I expected to feel. I felt a little guilt that I wasn't, you know, more torn up about it. It had become such a mechanical process, there wasn't really anything to, you know, feel guilty about. Right now I live on H Block, which is a block house for people that choose to work in their factory. Sitting here in the air conditioning, I've got a clean shirt on. When we leave about this visiting room and I enter into that other door, I'm in a whole other world. These are some of your starting wings for death row. These are your lockdown wings here, G Wing 13 and 15. So living on death row is a very stressful life. It's a living 
nightmare. Even in the daytime, it's a living nightmare. He'll write me a letter and try to keep it positive. You know, he doesn't want to burden me with his, with his situation, his problems. But every now and then, he'll end the letter saying he has to put the pen down because he can hear the screaming in the ward because someone is going to be executed in the morning. I think this is going to be the end of y'all trip here, right? Y'all have a good trip back. Y'all be good. Y'all stay safe. We have some 3,500 people on death row. What most people don't appreciate is that once their trial is over and their initial appeal is over, there is no constitutionally guaranteed right to counsel. So death row prisoners have to find lawyers willing to represent them, usually for free. Lawyers that do this work uh, do save lives. Of course, the other side of it is they also, uh, if you represent enough people facing the death penalty, you'll also have some times where people that you've worked with over a long period of time and come to know and care about uh, and see all of the good things in their life as well as the bad things uh, when you may have to stand by and watch that person be executed. Uh, but that's when it's most critical that we be there for people, uh, when people stand alone at the bar of justice and when people really need legal representation. Our system works best when there are good advocates. As a judge, I am much more confident that I have reached the right decision when there are good lawyers on both sides and, and they make it hard for me to decide. And so the adversarial process is critical to our whole system. Each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. And because you're more than that, you've got this basic human right, you've got this basic human dignity that has to be protected by the rule of law as opposed to the whim of man.